Okay. Hello, I am Larry Almo, and this is my name is David Biggs, and we are the community relations team of Aljoya Mercer Island. Today's presentation is climate change and Puget Sound marine ecosystems. Some of you don't know about Aljoya Mercer Island, and we thank everyone for uh, joining our Zoom today. But we're a premier retirement community located on Mercer Island with uh, spacious apartments and uh, life enrichment activities and entertainment. David and I are happy to answer any questions about our community or take a tour uh, uh, after uh, Zoom and after this event today. So you can call us and, and our name will, and numbers will be on there at the end. But now for our main event, uh, we, we are honored to have Dr. Nick Bond for today's presentation on climate change. Dr. Bond is a principal research scientist and the word scientist, he's gonna use a little bit of that today of the CICOES of the University of Washington. He has a PhD in atmospheric sciences from the UW. His research focuses on weather and climate of the Pacific Northwest and the linkage between the climate and marine ecosystems of the North Pacific. He is a climatologist for the state of Washington and I'm proud to be a weather geek. Is that true? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Dr. Bond's going to have a slide presentation. I will be mailing those out to, to um, those that want it. So I'll take care of that with them when I follow up my phone calls with you. If you want a, the slide presentation, I can mail it to you as well. And just and before you take it away, Dr. Bond, just one question for you. I, it's a burning question of mine is that are, are salmon safe in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, that's one of your best uh, choices for seafood around here, especially um, uh, fish that are caught in the Pacific. Uh, quite a f uh, bit of the salmon that is uh, sold around here in, um, in, and, uh, in restaurants and um, in the grocery stores is uh, farmed Atlantic salmon. That, that's pretty safe too. Much of it, it comes from Norway and Chile for what it's worth. But um, yeah, salmon's a good bet. Some of the aquaculture that's um, uh, yeah, yeah, from Asia and that sort of thing, uh, there are some questions about how uh, you know clean that product is. But um, yeah, salmon's a good bet. Okay, wonderful. Well, take it away, and we look forward to listening to you. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen, and um, you know, keep my fingers crossed. What you should be seeing here is a wonderful cartoon by David Horsey of a sailfish or marlin, uh, Puget Sound, you know, note the palm trees in the background and so forth. Does everybody see my screen and uh, hear me okay? Okay, I see a thumbs up. Yeah, like all good satire, this hits uncomfortably close to home. To be sure, we're not expecting these kinds of subtropical fish in Puget Sound anytime soon, but it, it does, the times are changing and it kind of makes you wonder. So what we're gonna do today is a kind of whirlwind tour of um, climate change and its impacts on our local marine ecosystem. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, a recent um, big event, a marine, what's called now a marine heat wave that happened a few years ago, the blob. Um, show you a little bit about uh, from the historical record, a little bit of uh, what uh, the climate models are showing um, along with other information about the future. Want to end on kind of a, a positive note about some of the actions that are being taken right now on behalf of our marine ecosystem. And all this, uh, like shown at the bottom, is from the kind of context of the marine ecosystem. All right, so here goes. Um, just a map of Puget Sound, uh, Salish Sea in, in particular. It's kind of a weird orientation here. You can see north is pointing kind of up and to the right. Um, these colors refer to how deep the, um, the waters are in various places. And actually, um, a little tidbit here, uh, the Salish Sea Puget Sound is a relatively productive and um, um, fjord. Um, there's a lot of fjords in Norway and other parts of the world that aren't any, or don't have 
nearly the kind of diversity and productivity of the marine life that we have around here. And in part, it's because these differences in uh, uh, bathymetric depth, there's a mixing of the waters that brings nutrients up and uh, kind of fuels a very um, um, productive uh, ecosystem. And so that's, it's kind of unique. And in fact, there's a whole book about it titled The Fertile Fjord. And so we're, we're really lucky to be at such a, such a place. Now, uh, Puget Sound and its marine ecosystem has gotten a lot of attention in the last you know, few years, decade. And unfortunately, this graph kind of illustrates one of the main reasons. And that's what's happened, the plight of the southern resident killer whales, the orcas, that um, there was a period some decades ago in which their numbers were climbing. They were recovering from all the, um, basically the harvesting of them to send them to sea aquariums and, you know, all around the world and that sort of thing. And so they, um, 25 years ago or something, the numbers were up there, but they have been declining since then. And this is of, um, of real concern. And so, uh, you know, just the kind of backdrop of what we're, we're facing around here. Okay, but just to kind of get your juices going and get you guys thinking, um, I've got a question for all of you. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some experts here sitting in. And so this, this question to everybody is, what is this white patch in the water up in the northern Puget Sound, kind of right near the Canadian border, Point Roberts. Um, <clears throat> a hint, it's a good thing. Another hint, those are seabirds there that are uh, obviously attracted to it. Does anybody want to hazard a guess about what this might be? What's this patch of white? I'm going to give you, if there's somebody wants to raise their hand and, you know, actually or type into the chat. If not, you know, we can, I can give you the answer, but anybody want to hazard a guess? And I'll uh, ask David if anybody's um, stepping up here. What, what could this be? One person said it's fish. Ah, very good. Yeah, and just, you know, just in the interest of time, this is actually herring spawn. This is a herring, uh, you may have seen these uh, fantastic balls of herring. They, they spawn as a group, you know, they got a name for that, right, you know. But anyway, um, uh, and so this is um, uh, their eggs, basically, um, that are, you know, hopefully being fertilized and the little fish are eating those. The seabirds are going for, you know, those little fish. And the reason why it's a good thing is because herring stocks also recently have been kind of on the decline and herring actually turns out to be a real important um, part of that ecosystem. It's a forage fish that uh, marine mammals like to eat, Chinook salmon like to eat, and, um, we're seeing, especially this cherry point near Bellingham, this stock really declining in, in numbers. And so just recently that we're seeing an uptick in herring spawning is, um, is a good sign. So anyway, just uh, threw that in there just to get your juices going. All right. Let's talk about an event that I now consider a four letter word, the blob. And that refers to this unusually warm water that was um, um, in the Northeast Pacific off our coast uh, some years ago, about five years ago. Uh, if you look at uh, for a box about a thousand kilometers on a side or so off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, we have some pretty good estimates of sea surface temperature going back over a hundred years and relative to kind of a baseline value there. Um, going back to 1900, you can see there's warm years and cold years and kind of warm periods and cold periods and you know, maybe a week upward trend and then, whoa, what happened here in 2014 through 2016? Out there, temperatures 
that we did not anticipate happening any time, you know, around this period, um, uncharted territory and kind of unsettling um, here in 2019 into 2020, another um, period of uh, much warmer water than normal. And um, so this has had big impacts on our um, marine ecosystem and a theme I'm gonna get back to. We're kind of trying to learn from this because it, in some ways it is kind of a dress rehearsal for climate change. Now that was for a box off the Pacific coast. Here in Puget Sound itself, direct your attention to this top plot here, uh, this bar graph just going back to 2008 with the blue color showing over the top 50 meters when it was kind of on the cool side. And here are the blob years. Oops, I said that four letter word. Um, they are especially 2015 through 2016 when it was really warm. Um, and then kind of continue in that way. Um, and then ju just direct your attention to this bottom bar chart here showing um, uh, dissolved oxygen contents in the waters of Puget Sound um, here where red means a deficit in oxygen. Um, you know, animals need to breathe just like we do and the lower oxygen concentrations they can literally suffocate. And so um, what that shows is during the cool period, there was actually fairly high oxygen concentrations, but um, starting even before the heyday of the blob, there have been some um, uh, periods of, of, of low oxygen concentrations. Another perspective on that, and especially a problem spot in the uh, Puget Sound region is in Hood Canal. And these uh, show for individual years, 2011 through 2019. The perspective here is on each of these charts, it's the top is at the surface and the bottom is at 30 meters down. The red colors show where there's lots of oxygen. The blue colors where it's uh, really low and to the point that um, a lot of animals just can't survive in that. We can see in these, um, you know, it's not just the blob years, but they were especially bad for oxygen concentrations at depth. We we're kind of lucky both summers, we had some storms come through and kind of stir up the water and kind of, so it didn't keep going, but there were some very low oxygen concentrations. And the result, this kind of washed out uh, photo, um, were um, dead fish, this um, uh, flat fish that washed up on shore in Hood Canal, that's a dead red rock crab. I think those are probably, well, um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what those are. It could, um, but anyway, there were some, definitely uh, some fish kills there in 2015. Now this uh, chart itself breaks all the rules about good graphics and presentations and, you know, guilty as charged and all that. What a, uh, some folks have done just looking at this uh, region of the San Juan Islands have kind of looked from both from the climate side, local kind of temperature and other conditions, and then at different um, uh, parts of the ecosystem, just how all those have gone together. And just the main point I want to get across there is during the, there were some cool years, relatively cool in earlier this decade. And during those periods, most um, of the elements of the marine ecosystem like seabird nesting success and um, uh, uh, marine mammal health and so forth, most of those were, um, were in good shape. And then during these warm years and kind of 2014 through 2016 continuing in there, there was um, uh, just things weren't as good for uh, many parts of the marine ecosystem. And so the idea that, you know, we, we have these kind of cold and warm years and cold and warm stanzas and the marine ecosystem responds to them. Another thing that we've seen recently um, that wasn't 
never seen before, but just in many cases, it's been seen in a bigger way is unusual things like this uh, particular um, bloom of this, uh, this species of plankton of algae that turns the water is just this kind of milky green. It's almost like glacial runoff. Um, and so this was, this was in 2017 as we we're kind of coming out of the um, very warm water of the blob. And uh, it actually, uh, it may look kind of striking, but if you're a seabird, um, it's really hard to find prey because this, uh, when these blooms are so thick, it uh, reduces the visibility. You just can't, um, if you're a visual feeder, you just can't find your prey. And so there, um, there can be problems when this uh, sort of thing happens. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the things that happened in the blob weren't restricted just to in the saltwater Puget Sound itself. That year, uh, where it really got it going in the winter of 1415 was the warmest winter in Pacific Northwest history, including Washington State. We had a fair amount of uh, near normal precipitation, but except for the highest elevations in the mountains, it fell as rain rather than snow. And so there was, um, we had um, some moderate floods, we had a lot of water coming down off the mountains because it rained. Um, and so what's shown in this graph for, which goes from January, 2015 through the end of September, 2015, this blue trace shows what the stream flow was each day um, through that year. These gold dots show the average for that time of year. And so we had some, some pretty big flows in the winter time, but because it was so warm and it was just rain rather than snow, the, um, there wasn't very much of any in some watersheds of uh, snow to melt to get us through at least the start of the dry season. And so the stream flow went into the toilet, kind of literally compared to normal. And at the same time, with those low stream flows, the temperatures in that stream, this happens to be the South Fork and the Nooksack River, went up. Uh, arose to levels that were um, much greater than usual for that time of year. And this had a really negative impact on the adult salmon who were trying to get back to their spawning beds and hatcheries. This happens to be in the, um, the Columbia River Gorge. That's a sockeye salmon that's not getting um, anywhere. And that's one with the fungus in the background that's probably not getting there. We actually had a record run of sockeye salmon come to uh, through Bonneville Dam and very few of those got to McNary Dam, just a few dams up the river. And so it was, um, um, and again, that um, those warm conditions uh, really did a number on some parts of the ecosystem and in, in particular, uh, the salmon. Now, there's um, always going to be disputes about, you know, well, how important climate change is, what we should do about it. And, the, you know, there's, uh, there's, it's a complicated policy uh, problem, of course. But um, I've, I'm personally of the opinion that we ignore what is happening and what's liable to continue to happen at our own peril. And um, so uh, again, thanks to David Horsey. Um, I should, if I ever meet him, I should give him like a hundred bucks or something. I, I've used his cartoons in so many of my talks that um, I owe him big time. But yeah, global warming is a real thing. And uh, again, um, we should do what we can um, about it, both to mitigate it and in terms of adapting to it. And, uh, you know, kind of starting off there, um, one thing that is not generally appreciated is just how much of that extra heat that's in the atmosphere ocean climate system is actually going into the ocean. And th this is a global perspective, but over 90% of the extra heat that we have coming out of the sky because of enhanced greenhouse gas concentrations, most of that is going into vast majority into the ocean. Couple percent is going into melting uh, ice 
both ice sheets and glaciers. A couple percent is actually heating up land. We got some borehole temperatures. We know about that. The atmosphere is only, you know, part of the tail of the dog. Only 2% of that extra heat is going into the atmosphere. And so people are arguing about, oh, the model's getting this right or something like that. The ocean is taking up a lot of the, the extra heat in the system. It's taking up about 30% of the extra carbon, and uh, but again, more than 90% extra heat. Well, I want to go back. Um, here, you know, another piece of evidence about what's going on, sea level rise. You know, um, imagine most of you have heard about that. If we just look at the tide gauge in Elliott Heart, um, Bay, you know, here in Seattle, time series going back to 1900, the upward trend is unmistakable um, in terms of sea level rise. Really big El Ninos, actually, there's temporarily higher sea level because of the warmer water is such, uh, associated with um, El Nino. Um, it turns out the trends are not constant around Puget Sound. There's still um, the geologic processes that are impacting sea level. It's rising a little faster than sea level someplace, uh, in Seattle and some places. And Nia Bay, which is still, the ground is still rebounding from the being held down in the last ice age, sea level is actually going down uh, there. But for the most part, it is going up, or, well, certainly globally and here in the Puget Sound region. And there's going to be implications associated with that. Speaking of those implications, one thing that I want to kind of stress here is to avoid the doom and gloom sort of perspective. This cartoon that was published, you know, 10 years ago or something about how all the world's oceans are all going to go to the Dead Sea. No way. The sun's still going to come up. There's still going to be nutrients. Um, phytoplankton will grow. Other things are going to eat that. There's going to be a food web. There's going to be some differences in those food webs, but it's not like, um, yeah, everything's going to die. Uh, it's just there's going to be losers to be sure, but there's going to be some winners too. And speaking of how things are liable to change, there is a, um, a very uh, thorough report um, that was put out um, about a year ago about how the ocean and the cryosphere, the kind of ice sheets and glaciers and so forth are liable to change. Um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This weighs in at about 1,200 pages, so it's not exactly um, nighttime reading. It is um, available for download, and um, you know I, I've looked at much of it um, in in some detail, and you know going to um, show you a few little tidbits from it here. One. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that temperature isn't the only thing that's changing. And I you know, mentioned the rise in sea level before showing you the example from Seattle. There's, uh, we've seen um, you know, this hurricane season, uh, a much stormier, um, not just due to climate change itself, but a much stormier year. And so the chance for altered rainfall patterns um, um, and, um, you know, things, what we're doing to the land surface with nutrient supplies from, um, you know, coming into the, the rivers, and then what we're doing to the ocean in terms of its changes in chemistry. And so all this is working together in a complicated way to, um, to kind of changing the, um, the kind of terms of engagement or something in terms of how the ecosystem works. But uh, the first starting at temperature here, if, um, and uh, again, uh, this kind of with that theme that it's not all doom and gloom. If we look at what the climate models are suggesting as a group under kind of a worst case scenario for what the kind of first half of this century is relative to roughly the last half of the 20th century, how the temperatures are changing and uh, expected to change in the North Pacific, you can see uh, a degree plus Celsius, maybe two degrees Fahrenheit increase 
you know, it's not like it's the oceans are going to boil away or anything like that. And so there's, you know, the, the changes are, are kind of um, modest. They're uh, expected to accelerate later in the century, but in the near term, it's, um, it's not like it's going to be a whole different world. Um, I apologize, these are kind of a little fuzzed out, but, you know, focusing down again in our backyard here, if I'm now looking at a somewhat different perspective, you know, later uh, toward the end of this century versus um, the recent past, now we're looking at uh, temperatures right along the coast that are much warmer relative to that uh, baseline. Um, but what you might uh, notice here is that in the um, Salish Sea, Puget Sound, Strait of Georgia and so forth, somewhat um, less warming uh, from the end of the you know, 21st century versus you know, 2000. And that's in part because, uh, in large part, because the water that is coming into Puget Sound here comes in at, uh, at depth and um, it goes out near the um, near the surface. And so that water that's coming in hasn't been warmed up as much by the change in the climate. And so you might think, oh, I'm pretty good. Maybe we'll be in good shape. But if you really then focus down here, just looking at around, um, you know, kind of Snohomish County uh, region, that sure, the um, open sound may be not uh, warming up as much. But you, when you get right down into these critical uh, nursery areas that are the estuaries, um, again, expecting some uh, pretty marked warming by the, the end of this century. All right. Now, I had mentioned that, you know, the, the blob years and especially the winter of 14, 15, but continuing into 15, 16 was kind of a dress rehearsal for climate change, wake up call, that sort of thing. And what we saw there with, um, was um, extra runoff during the winter because the precipitation falling in the mountains, except for the highest elevations, was more uh, a greater proportion of rain versus snow than usual. And so what we're uh, expecting, especially as we get toward the end of this century, um, as indicated by these green colors, and it kind of depends on what path the world goes in terms of fossil fuel combustion and greenhouse gas emissions and so forth. But we're expecting bigger runoff in the, in the winter months. And um, you know, some watersheds more than others that change. And then because there's less of uh, snow there to get us through the dry season that is uh, summer around here, lower runoff in the summer, especially as we get into toward the ends of the century. We technically have a Mediterranean climate here in Puget Sound. So next time you're at you know, Golden Gardens or something like that, you can imagine you're actually a Saint-Tropez on the French Riviera or something like that. Um, you know, if it works for you, I have more power to you. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we're expecting if anything, we're, our wet, uh, winters are liable to be wetter and our summers drier. So it's not just this kind of change in temperature, but um, even a, a kind of an exaggerated sort of Mediterranean climate. And what this is, this is going to have some impacts on our rivers and what happens to our rivers impact Puget Sound too. Um, but one size does not fit all. And so there are some rivers, like the Samish River, these are all examples from the kind of northwest part of Washington State, that is a low watershed, uh, a low elevation watershed. It gets rain now and is expected to get mostly rain in the future in fall and winter. And so this black line shows, on average, um, the stream flow in that stream versus the time of year. A lot of water in the wet season, not much in summer. With climate change, maybe go up in the winter, a little bit drier in the summer. But if you're a stock of salmon living in that river, you know, your timing is about, the, is about okay. And so if you can handle, you know, potentially warmer temperatures, yeah, you know, maybe you'll be okay. 
But there are other rivers that have a different kind of seasonal cycle. Right now for the Snohomish River it gets some snow and some rain in the winter. And so it gets some big flows, floods even. And so it has a kind of a seasonal peak there. And then another later seasonal peak having to do with the snow melt. And that river is expected to become more a rain dominant kind of river where it just gets rain, mostly rain in the winter. And um, this second peak that it's, uh, you know, its current residents have presumably adapted to is not liable to be there in, you know, as we get late, much later into the, um, this century. And then that we have some rivers, the Sauk River, the Columbia in, a, in many ways is this way too, it, it, that's snow dominant, that, um, you know, gets some increases in flow in the fall, but uh, right now in its present um, sort of configuration, it gets, um, most of its uh, stream flow with snow melt. And that's gonna go to more of this double peak sort of one where it gets some rain and some snow. And so again, the, the fish that are in these uh, streams and um, you know, the ones in the estuaries coming out of them, um, it, it could be kind of a different situation. There's liable to be in the future. I'd mentioned stream temperatures before, and one of the real concerns here is as the climate warms, that our streams are going to warm also. And uh, salmon and trout, they don't like really warm water. And the problem with those blob years, I showed you the uh, dead salmon that weren't getting to the uh, spawning grounds, was because of the, um, some of the very warm temperatures they encountered. And unfortunately, that is. Um, looks to be more and more the case overall. Um, not every year. This year is liable to be a good one coming up. La Nina winters, we get a lot of snow. It tends to be on the cool side. So maybe not a problem this year, but when we have another blob event, you know, uh, that's what we're worried about. We can do something about this and kind of hang on to Beth Otto. We'll get to that in a minute. All right. I've uh, blabbed a, a bunch here, so I'm going to um, ask you guys a question here. I, I, you know, I use the term marine heat wave. Everybody knows about heat waves, you know, when it's hot in the summer and that sort of thing. So do you think we're going to have, and we're talking here about the frequency, do you think we're looking at more of a kind of weather type atmospheric heat waves or more you know, ones in the marine environment or the water temperatures with climate change, which one do you think is going to increase in frequency more? Now, this is a, uh, this is a tough question. This is one for grad students. Uh, but um, I'm just kind of curious about what, uh, what people might have be thinking about this one. So I'm going to pause for a sec and let David, um, you know, see if anybody wants to suggest an answer. All right. So one person said marine. Ah. And then another person said equally. Ah. Okay. Equal frequency, and two other people said marine as well. Okay, wow, I got some ringers here. I was afraid of that. Yeah, it actually, um, uh, and uh, this is, you know, maybe a little complicated, but, you know, I'm a scientist and make no apologies for, you know, making you suffer through this. But yeah, we're expecting more marine heat waves. And the idea there is that uh, the air temperatures are naturally very, uh, quite variable. We can have really cold days and really hot days. And that's just part of the system that there's a real wide range of temperatures. And so the distribution of temperatures relative to some normal, there's a really long tails, both on the negative side and the positive side relative to what's you know, normal for that day. And with the shift, um, there toward warmer temperatures. Yeah, we're going to have um, more heat waves, but um, you know, it's um, to get to temperatures that constitute that you know one out of a hundred type of a day. 
uh, maybe you know not that many more in terms of frequency. The very warmest ones are going to be hotter, but uh, in terms of frequency, you know, may uh, like it shows in this cartoon, maybe double. It's kind of a different story for the ocean. Yeah, the, the temperatures there's a lot more thermal inertia in the ocean, and so the temperature range is just not as large. And so even though the the actual change in the temperature might uh, the uh, here this is shown by this arrow might not be as great in the ocean as it is in land by moving just a little bit um and then now this kind of tails of the distribution are in the place where that which constitutes a real rare event compared to the um historical climate so we're expecting um you know a lot of marine heat waves blob type uh, events to become increasingly frequent. So thanks for, for answering. Now in terms of temperature and uh, you know kind of here in Puget Sound, it's you know it's a complicated story. Sure. When there's warm temperatures here and we're looking at the return of adult Chinook salmon, in South, uh, South Puget Sound rivers, when they're really warm temperatures, those returns are almost always on the low side. When there's cooler water, it doesn't absolutely guarantee good returns, but it seems to be kind of in necessary conditions. And so there's, you know, there's a lot going on and it's just not all temperature. One thing, we'll never get the salmon kind of, um, uh, you know, runs that we got in the 1800s when it was just, you know, uh, even a boom time for the economy as a result. And so we have to recognize we're never getting that back, but um, we can do something to try to uh, keep them as, as healthy as possible. Uh, just very briefly, I want to mention that, you know, again, temperature isn't the only thing changing the ocean. Uh, the chemistry, the ocean acidification, the waters are essentially getting um, slowly but inexorably more corrosive. And so if you're a shill building species, there's kind of an energy cost to that. And if the pH gets too low, it can actually dissolve your shill. And then, you know, that, that's not a happy camper. And um, some impacts all up and down the food chain. And speaking of, uh, we're trying to figure out what all those are gonna, how those are gonna work out. But as you might guess, that is a pretty complicated problem. If you look at the food web for Puget Sound, um, and here, you know, focusing on what ocean acidification is doing, there's a, these are kind of lower trophic levels, you know, kind of the, the plankton, and then the little guys that eat that, and then the smaller fish, and then the uh, top predators. There's something here that even since this work has been done, something called a ratfish that is a, a bigger and bigger box indicating that it's a more important part of that ecosystem. And people don't really kind of recognize that, but that kind of ugly looking thing is a huge part of our ecosystem here and seems to be increasing in numbers. We don't know if this is a good or bad thing. It uh, eats little worms and other little invertebrates along the floor and seems to be kind of a dead end for the energy coming into the system. Nobody really wants to eat a ratfish, um, but what that means, um, anyway, that's the, that's the way Puget Sound is going. And what we anticipate with uh, increasing problems with ocean acidification, that there are, there are some species that are gonna kind of decline. Others that maybe will be out uh, able to outcompete those species like flatfish. And so again, they're winners along with some losers. The ones that are build shells as the oceans acidify, they're, they're gonna have a, a tougher and tougher go. Another thing we're anticipating is kind of an increased windows that have favorable con conditions for harmful algal blooms. Uh, that's already a problem, a human health issue in Pu Puget Sound waters. And uh, when temperatures are warm enough, it doesn't absolutely guarantee a bloom, but it seems to be kind of a necessary condition for it. And we'll just, we're anticipating that uh, a 
greater length of time in which um, the waters will support. In this case, this is um, a type of algae alexandrium that causes a really potent neurotoxin, um, paralytic shellfish poisoning um, that you don't want any piece of. Uh, it can be fatal, um, in fact. Uh, the other thing we're seeing and have to anticipate is as again, sea level rise is going on um, that what our present kind of, what's going on in the estuaries where there are tidal marshes versus beaches versus swamps and so forth, that's gonna shift. And how that's all gonna play out is not completely understood at all. But there, there are going to be some repercussions and there's going to be some habitat that opens up and other habitat that's going to be lost. And we're trying to figure out again um, how that's going to work all going to work out. Um, but I want to end up on a um, just with some actions on kind of a positive note and some of the things that are being done on behalf of Puget Sound. There's a state agency called Puget Sound Partnership that it doesn't have regulatory or um, authority or a lot of money, but is trying to kind of, um, you know, galvanize some of the uh, things that we need to do to protect and restore Puget Sound. And one of the things that I think is really important is kind of the realization that um, a healthy ecosystem has direct benefits to humans. Um, people uh, want to be outside and enjoy the environment when it's a pleasant place to be. And um, uh, the actions taken on behalf of Puget Sound benefit everybody. And we're trying to figure out, you know, especially for the, uh, from an environmental justice point of view that some of the folks um, that have, um, don't have the resources maybe to drive up to, you know, the mountains and so forth, they, they uh, deserve to be able to enjoy the environment too. And in fact, one of the top priorities of the uh, Puget Sound Partnership is to try to figure out how we uh, incorporate social sciences and thinking about the human element along with the biological targets that we want to hit. And uh, you know how this can really move the needle in terms of um, policy and public opinion and so forth. We got a lot of ways to go. There's uh, these all these red streams here show where at least the Chinook salmon, the you know the ones the orcas like to eat, a signature species. Most of them are in kind of rough shape. There, there's some few exceptions. The Skagit system is in a little better shape. We have some ways to go. That's to be sure. But there are things that are being uh, being done on behalf of the environment. It's expensive fixing culverts so the, uh, the juvenile fish can get to the sound and the adults can get back and not just salmon, but just for the freshwater ecosystem health in general. Um, again, this isn't cheap, but it's being done. We're starting to knock down some of the dams that have outlived their function. Here, this one just this summer on the Nooksack River this dam was put up to provide drinking water for Bellingham. It's not needed anymore. It was actually removed and there's gonna be uh, many miles of pristine habitat that's now open up to salmon. In a big way, you know, the removal of the Elwha dams um, took a long time to do it, but that's a real success story. And so maybe some more of this is gonna be done, um, but, um, Right now, I think the focus at least is on some of these smaller um, streams and uh, dams that have clearly outlived their useful function. I wanna give a shout out to the tribes around here. The ones in the Northwest are very well informed. They, they've led some of the work that's uh, gone on to try to figure out how climate change is gonna um, impact the marine ecosystem. To the extent they can, they want to hang on to the traditional foods and so forth. And so again, they're um, um, they're part and parcel of the work that's uh, that's going on um, of, of that sort. And in particular, some of the um, that work is trying to figure out what we can do to the streams. Um, um, 
coming into Puget Sound to restore them to a more natural state rather than channels um, that are kind of engineered and make them more uh, like the way they usually uh, they were in the past and just um, a healthier environment um, for, uh, yeah, for the critters in them. I'm just going to skip this one, but um, yeah, I have nothing else. Planting shade along our streams can help a lot in keeping them cool. Okay, one last question for you guys. Uh, here's an example of a restoration, a successful restoration project. May not look very impressive here, but these kind of estuaries, you can't really boat here. Of course, you can't farm it, you know, can't put a house there. But these kind of sort of areas are really key to, um, to Puget Sound. So where do you think this place is? And I bet you all of you have driven past it, a part of it. All right, so one person said the Nisqually Delta. Oh, man. <laughs> Give that person a cigar. Yeah, again, I was afraid I had some um, <laughs> ringers here. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it uh, turns out that um, there's been a very successful restoration there. There's a wildlife viewing area, the Billy Frank, uh, I forget the exact name, but it, um, and it is having demonstrable effects. And so we do have some success stories. Uh, uh, eelgrass beds. Um, one little piece of good news is they actually grow that uh, they grow faster in warmer water. There are regions where they could be restored, and you know the, it's not like we overnight. But these eelgrass beds um, are can be very important habitat for some of the um, uh, you know the animals around Puget Sound, and so. Uh, conceivably with, um, we can do better here in terms of kind of restoring some of this habitat. And then finally, I want to, I'm not sure if Aljoya has um, a facility in Shoreline, but I want to give a shout out to a, a particular municipality that is really leading the way in terms of trying to, you know, do what it can for Puget Sound. And that is the city of Shoreline under the leadership of Alex Hall. Um, here in the middle, and that they have really trying to do what they can to, um, you know, promote uh, stream health and prevent, uh, you know, toxic runoff into the sound and so forth. And so this is an example of, um, you know, a local municipality to be sure, um, but uh, again, of a success story. So just to summarize, we've had uh, this dress rehearsal um, of uh, climate change, the, the blob years, uh, a few years back here that we're learning from and um, learning what parts of the system are resilient, what parts are really sensitive to temperature and so forth. And uh, the question I'm going to leave you with, and maybe there'll be some discussion is, you know, obviously we don't have the infinite resources in given, you know, current um, problems and that sort of thing, but still what what should we do in recognition of the changing climate to try to preserve this, um, uh, the Puget Sound that we all, um, you know, you're attending this talk, you obviously care about it, but that we all care about. And so I'll leave that as an open question and um, pr appreciate you kind of sitting in today. And so let's go. All right, thanks Dr. Nick Bonds. Uh, looks like we don't have any other, other questions unless someone wants to type some into the chat box, they can. Or you could, um, I'd be okay, you know, there's not too many of us here, just unmute everybody and just, you know, shout them out. And yeah, let's, let's have a little discussion. Um, I'm sure somebody's got a question. Okay, so everyone's on. I'm going to try to unmute everyone here. So everyone can ask a question if they want to right now. If we have anything. Don't be bashful. <laughs> are, we, are we unmuted? I think so. Yeah. What, what is your opinion of sewage outfalls in Puget Sound? Is there any improvement that can be done there? Yeah. Wow. 
you started me out on a hard one. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a real uh, contentious issue just um, in certain places. Um, and that's certainly a problem, especially in the South Sound where they're kind of more sluggish uh, circulation. And there's even commercial shellfish beds that have been kind of tainted with that. Um, in other places, it's not clear whether um, it makes a huge difference. And so one size doesn't fit all. In general, I think there's um, a, a kind of a, we're going toward trying to remove the nutrients going into Puget Sound now, and that that is um, kind of messing up the ecosystem. What happens when those nutrients go in, they can promote too much of an algae bloom. And when those, uh, when that, um, those algae decompose bacteria, break them down and consume oxygen and that it can have repercussions on the system. But um, yeah, again, it's, uh, there are certain places where that's a bigger problem than other uh, um, places and um, how expensive it will be to make um, you know, relatively minor impacts is something that we just have to kind of figure out and, uh, and settle. And so that, that's a kind of an ongoing issue. And great question. Okay, uh, we just got another question here in the chat box. Uh, Mark Blitzer asked if we can, if we are able to get a handle on increasing the rise in air temperatures, will ocean temperatures follow just more slowly? Yeah, yeah. So in some of these talks that I give, you're exactly right. Very insightful there that the ocean, because of its kind of thermal capacity, is going to slow, uh, is warming more slowly than kind of land areas. And so the kind of coastal regions, the west side of the mountains, uh, not going to warm as fast as the east side because of that. And um, so, yeah, exactly right. And even though the oceans are taking up from a uh, kind of total energy heat perspective, a lot more of the um, extra heat in the system, their temperatures are actually rising slower than um, atmospheric temperatures and uh, therefore, you know, kind of temperatures over land. And um, one consequence there that we're starting to think about is whether with um, lesser warming here on the west side of the Cascades, will the Puget Sound area ultimately be kind of a place for climate refugees? And um, arguably Phoenix is not uh, suitable for human habitation in summer. Are we gonna get people from Phoenix moving up here and just that much more, uh, you know, kind of uh, stress on our systems here. But um, yeah, the, the bottom line is that um, while uh, the oceans are warming slower, um, but at the same hand, uh, same time, those um, the denizens of the ocean are, are maybe a little bit more sensitive to that warming than. Um, in some places over land. So it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of elements to that question. Okay, uh, thanks Nick. Look like we have one more question here. Okay. This is, uh, Sarah asks, do we anticipate more dramatic storms, stronger winds, more uh, ter terrainal rains, yeah. more time, more storm surges? Yeah, well, yeah, great question. And we're already seeing, especially in other parts of the country, but even around here, some uh, tentative evidence that when it rains hard, it rains that much harder than it did before. And so, yeah, uh, heavier rainstorms, that seems to be with kind of a, uh, a warmer atmosphere, that seems to be a pretty sure bet. In terms of the more storms and stronger storms. Uh, right now, it doesn't look like there necessarily will be a greater frequency of storms, but that the very strongest ones will be stronger than they have been in the past. And that um, 
So the real doozies, the kind of ones that get the name, the Columbus Day Storm, the Inauguration Day Storm, the Hanukkah Eve Storm, that those sorts of ones will be um, somewhat stronger. And that does have implications for storm surge in that um, as sea level rise continues, um, uh, you know, when you get that triple whammy of that sea level rise, especially high tide, and then you have a very strong storm on it with just the winds just right, the, um, the coastal flooding will become more and more of a problem. And one of the places around Puget Sound that that is especially going to be the case is kind of downtown Olympia and also Harbor Island here in the Seattle area. That's basically the remains of Denny Hill there. And then it's not very much above sea level. And so we're, um, that's something to keep an eye on. So great question. We have two more questions. We're out of time, but we have two more questions. Nick, do you have a couple minutes for a couple more questions? Oh yeah, yeah, I got all morning. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this one was from Janet. Uh, her question is, what bird species here are apt to be more affected by climate change? Uh, say again, the, the species more uh, affected by climate? Yeah, what, uh, what bird species are oh, oh. more affected by? Ah, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we had during the blob years, um, we had some massive die-offs of uh, seabirds along um, uh, first along the Pacific Northwest coast and then in the Gulf of Alaska. And the ones that um, target um, the kind of cold water um, zooplankton, the kind of the bugs in the, um, in the marine system um, are the ones that are going to be, um, you know, really under the gun. And so the, a common mirror is one of those. There's um, uh, a type of uh, kind of, it looks like a, almost like a little miniature seagull, a type of auklet off our coast that uh, in the winter of, uh, let's see, that was 1415, there was a massive die off of that. And so ones that are really specific in their prey preferences that like cold water species, those are the ones that are gonna um, do poorly or have to move north to, go to colder water. And so, um, but then, you know, the others that maybe can handle the um, different kind of prey base will prosper at their expense. Okay, thanks, Nick. And then one more question here from Cheryl. Uh, she says that uh, she imagined this must be a very exciting time for graduate students and with some of the implications for increased temperatures in the Northwest environment, uh, can you address some of the questions that graduate qu students are studying right now? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. And here, what um, uh, is increasingly being the case is that we're not, um, we're getting away from stovepipes and that multidisciplinary work where, um, I have an atmospheric science and climate background, but I've learned to pronounce some of these, you know, <laughs> species names and that sort of thing and work with um, uh, biological oceanographers. And so this idea of uh, the kind of multidisciplinary work is doing more and more. And that's where we can really make some um, headway. And, and in particular, um, the multidisciplinary, and I kind of mentioned this in my talk, uh, kind of the uh, the social sciences, um, along with the um, physical and biological sciences. You know, these are important, complicated problems, and we we need different approaches. And we need to know what kind of can move the needle in terms of um, setting policy to you know protect our systems and to kind of um, figure out what uh, you know what people really benefit from what the economic, the true economic uh, costs and benefits are and so forth. And so I think it's actually an exciting time from a research point of view, uh, not necessarily just, you know, in the uh, drilling down to, you know, a really being the expert on just one little specific topic, 
and so forth, but more of a kind of a, uh, these multidisciplinary problems and approaches. Thank you very much for your time, David. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm sure we've learned a lot here today. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate your um, uh, attention. And um, yeah, the contact information, you can find the climate office if any sort of follow up. I know these slides will be made available. And, um, you know, thanks again and um, enjoy the La Nina winter and in a way, you know, the cool and wet conditions we are, you know, maybe your socks will it would seem like I'll never dry out and so forth, but this tends to be good snowpack for us and in a way kind of at least temporarily counteract that inexorable warming associated with climate change. So um, enjoy the La Nina and um, thanks again. All right, thank you so much, Nick. And we will be emailing everyone uh, evaluation forms so we can get some of your feedback on what we all learned here today. And also one thing I will show you, here's our contact info. That's my email right there. So you can have, if you have any questions at all or just have any other feedback for what you saw here today, you can send that to my email at david.biggs at airliving.com or you can also send it to Larry's email too at larry.lml.com at, at, at airliving.com, excuse me. And um, and that's it. If you have any questions about Abjoy Mercer Island, or if you'd like to schedule a tour, uh, please call us at 206-230-0150. And Larry, any other words? Yep, we'll be getting the information to you. And also the feedback form is very important. We love this out of the box type of uh, uh, seminar we had here where retirement community and people say, Oh, you talk about brain aging, you talk about aging. You talk, yes, we do. But this was also using your brain today. Nick, you put us to the test today. So that was good. But uh, fill out those feedback forms. It will help us for our calendar year to have similar type events that you can join on next year too until we're um, finished with Zoom and we'll be back in the community again with our events. And I just want to wish uh, everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. And uh, it's a little bit different this year, but... We're all making adjustments to make it work. And thank you all for joining. And especially thank you to our presenter who took this time to share it with us. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Hey, that was fun. And I, I was impressed with uh, the answers and the insights from the questions. And, um, and so, again, um, you know, yeah. Thank you, Nick. Oh, thank yeah. You. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. That was terrific. Okay. Very Thanks, informative. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of science is a good thing it wasn't after lunch, right? I put everybody to sleep, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.